Hello, my name is Marshall Dozier and I'm one of the academic support librarians for the School of Medicine at the University of Edinburgh. This presentation is aimed at participants of the Masters in Clinical Trials, though it may be of interest to students on other programmes. Part of the academic support librarian's remit is to support staff and students to use information resources available through the library services, so please don't hesitate to contact us if you've got any questions following this presentation, either about the library or about information resources generally. The aims of this presentation are, firstly, to raise a few issues in relation to the research literature and links to informing further research and clinical practice, and secondly, to highlight a few online resources that will help you to identify evidence summaries, practice guidelines, research literature, and clinical trials, whether they're completed or ongoing. The first point I'd like to illustrate is a lag in time between when effectiveness, or indeed ineffectiveness, of particular treatments is established in research and when they become clinical practice. This table is from a study of research publications and practice recommendations by Anpan and colleagues published in 1992. This particular table is a bit complicated, so I will give a short explanation. At the left, you can see a timeline of years from 1960 to 1990. And against those years is mapped the cumulative number of randomized controlled trials conducted to assess the effect of thrombolytic therapy after myocardial infarction measured by patient deaths. The cumulative number of trial subjects, or PTS at the top, is also shown. In the middle, we see a kind of a chart called a forest plot, similar to what you may have seen in systematic reviews showing a meta-analysis of primary numerical data. I'll say a bit more about meta-analyses and systematic reviews later in this presentation. In the forest plot, there's a vertical line of no effect down the middle, and for the cumulative data at the time of each new RCT, you can see a bold round dot indicating the cumulative finding on the effectiveness of the intervention. The horizontal line going through each dot indicates the confidence interval for the finding. So as you can see, although the early studies and their cumulative findings were in favour of treatment, it wasn't until the early 1970s that the confidence intervals no longer crossed the line of no effect. By the end of the 1970s, there could be no doubt of the effectiveness of this treatment. At the right of the diagram, you can see a table that follows the same chronological period, indicating the frequency and type of recommendation that thrombolytic therapy is given in medical textbooks and reviews. It's not until the late 1980s that thrombolytic therapy is routinely recommended in patients with myocardial infarction, and even then there are some texts lagging behind. This study highlights a few matters then. There is a lag between establishing clear evidence for an intervention and its routine use. So one may consider the impact of the health and lives of patients in that period. But also, more and more randomized controlled trials were performed in a context where it could probably be claimed there was no longer equipoise in our understanding of the effectiveness of thrombolytic therapy. One could argue that the resources spent on conducting further trials could more effectively have been spent on other necessary research. You may remember that this paper by Antman was published in 1992, so you could argue that things are better now, about 20 years later, and they are for sure, but there are still problems. A recent review of studies of lags between research findings and translation into practice by Morris and colleagues found that the most likely length of delay between research and practice is 17 years. Needless to say, the limitations of the study, or rather the data available, must be borne in mind. The various available primary studies found by the reviewers were not all looking at the time between clear research evidence and uh, clinical practice, like the study between Antman et al. that we were looking at a moment ago. For example, some began at different phases of clinical research and ended at publication of findings instead. This raises a further issue in the literature to publish or not to publish, you might already have heard of something called publication bias. This is manifested in a tendency 
for journals more readily to accept papers that demonstrate positive results than those submissions which show neutral or negative results. After all, most journals are commercially published and it's easy to understand that papers showing positive results are more likely to sell. You'll no doubt have read in the press recently about moves to make research findings more publicly available, including the raw research data from studies showing negative and neutral outcomes. The work of Ben Goldacre and his books Bad Science and Bad Pharma are part of this movement. This remains a contentious issue, and in the reference list at the end of this presentation, I've put a link to a very interesting Cyblogs post that sets out some pros and cons of publishing negative or neutral findings. So, one difficulty with getting the most up-to-date information on therapeutic effectiveness is that it might not be out there to access. But conversely, another real problem is the sheer amount of information that is published, about 500,000 article records are added annually to the PubMed database, which we'll look at in a moment. And even considering that only a small proportion will be relevant to a particular specialist area, there's no realistic way to keep up with all the literature that you would need to read, compare and assimilate in your specialism. Before looking at the search tools, let's start with a scenario that we can apply in a few example searches. Pause the video for just a moment and read the scenario. At the bottom of the slide, you can see I've picked out key elements from the scenario using a fairly common template called PICOS. Patient or problem, intervention, comparison, outcome, and study design. This template can be very helpful in structuring your thinking around a clinical query, though of course not all healthcare questions have all elements from that template. I'm doing two things in this slide. First, to explain a bit more about the PICOS template, and second, to look at how your question concepts, and therefore your search terms, combine with one another. So first, the PICOS question template. The approach was described in 1997 by David Sacker and colleagues in a book to support evidence-based practice, and it's commonly used even in some database search interfaces. Taking a structured approach to literature search questions, as well as questions from research or practice, is thought to lead to better articulated and more effective searching with more relevant results. PICO as a format is most appropriate for questions about therapeutic effectiveness. If you have other types of questions, then you could consider using fewer or different components for structuring your question. For example, if you were interested in the prevalence of a condition, you would probably just want to use the P for population and O for outcome components. Or perhaps you might want to understand how exposure to something influences health outcomes, in which case you might have the P for population, and instead of an intervention, you would have an exposure, and then the outcome of interest. If you look around, you'll find variations of the PICO structure, for example, PICOS, as we were using here, or PICOT, and in both cases, the S or the T stand for the design, study design, or type of study. There are other variations as well. The thing to remember is you shouldn't feel obliged to use the structure slavishly. Think about the relevance to your question and adapt or adopt as you feel is most appropriate. Now, just to explain about the diagram, why I've used the overlapping circles or the Venn diagram to illustrate the PICOS components. You might also be wondering why I've put my O and my S in the same section. The Venn diagram helps me to illustrate how the different parts of my question will be combined in practice in a search. I will be combining interchangeable terms such as the abbreviation PTSD and its full spelling using the combining operator OR. So into each circle you can cluster synonyms, related terms or alternative spellings. Then the different circles and the way they overlap represent how I will be using the combining operator AND to achieve search results that contain at least one term from each circle. Related to that point, then, is the reason I've combined my outcomes with study design for this question. 
I'd want to see all controlled trials about PTSD that compare CBT with medical interventions, regardless of whether the specific outcomes are described at title or abstract level. Also, there may be other outcomes that I've not thought of, but that would be interesting to see, so this approach is a bit more flexible. Bear in mind that although having this highly structured approach can lead to very targeted search results, it is also very restrictive. So you should be prepared to adapt your search if you think you're not getting representative results. Please take a few minutes to think about a clinical question of your own. Incidentally, the EBM workbook mentioned here is also a good place to get more practice with the PCOS question format if you'd like to explore that further. So pause the presentation and when you're ready, move on to the next slide. Next, onto these online resources that are good examples of some databases to help address the problems I raised earlier. The Cochrane Library is named after Archie Cochrane, a Scottish doctor and epidemiologist who advocated better use of evidence in medical practice and better planning of research efforts to avoid unnecessary waste. The Cochrane Library is a product of the Cochrane Collaboration. You might have heard of them because they're very well known for their systematic reviews. A systematic review is a comprehensive survey of all comparable data, usually addressing a very narrow and focused research question. The Cochrane reviews are mostly about questions of therapeutic effectiveness and mostly draw heavily on clinical trials. Systematic reviews are sometimes also referred to as meta-analyses, though in the UK the term meta-analysis is usually only used to describe secondary analysis of quantitative data. Not all systematic reviews contain a meta-analysis, and this might be because the primary data is qualitative, or because although the review looks at quantitative primary data, the data are not sufficiently comparable in this way. The screenshot shows part of a results display on, uh, for a search on three elements of the PICOS list from earlier, the patient's condition, terms to capture the medical intervention, and I've included depression as it was particularly important in the scenario. There are a few technical elements of the example search that I should point out. Note that I've used both abbreviations, like PTSD, as well as the full spellings. Also, I've put an asterisk at the end of word stems to allow variation in the word endings. Finally, note that I've put OR as a combining term between synonymous terms, and I've used the plus button sign at the end of the search box to add more search boxes for the other key elements of the scenario, which are then combined with AND. Bear in mind what I was saying about the PICO structure earlier. You might be wondering why I've only got an outcome of depression in my search. There is no single correct way to do a search and you can take different approaches and arrive at very good results. My rationale was this. PTSD is already mentioned in my search, so it's in the patient problem bit, and depression was important in the scenario, so I should get results mentioning both. Also, I've not bothered to search for study design because the Cochrane Library mostly brings together study designs or publication types that would already be most relevant to me, like systematic reviews synthesizing primary studies or the trials themselves. At the left of the results list, you can see the types of results that are available here. We've got 34 full-text Cochrane Collaboration systematic reviews, 30 summaries of other non-Cochrane reviews, 489 records of clinical trials, and a few other bits and pieces. So you can see the Cochrane Library includes several databases, also including the Health Technology Assessment, Economic Evaluation Reports, and other things that are not necessarily actually produced by the Cochrane Collaboration. This screen grab shows just the first few, few results in the list. Um, two of them are Cochrane Reviews, they look like a good place for our GP to, um, to find a summary of available evidence. However, you might think that the second one in particular is possibly out of date now, since it was published a while ago. So let's pretend that's important to you, and let's look next at some resources that might help us find more up-to-date work. Incidentally, about the Cochrane, don't be too disappointed if there isn't a systematic review on your topic of interest. 
The database of systematic reviews is fairly small, especially when you compare it to something like PubMed, which has over 20 million records. There are fewer than 10,000 Cochrane systematic reviews. But if you consider that it takes months to gather and synthesize the body of comparable research data on particular interventions, then it's more understandable that there are relatively few systematic reviews. A section of the library that may be particularly useful to you is the Trials Database, which is the aggregate repository of all the trials found by Cochrane reviewers. So this could be a really uh, useful first place to look for trials when you're doing some searching. I wanted to mention clinical guidelines as a potential source to consider in planning research. Here is an example of clinical guidelines produced by the Scottish Intercollegiate Guidelines Network. You can search, see in the left-hand navigation column, or browse. I'm going to click to browse by subject. And since my topic is probably most likely to be under mental health, I'll click on that topic area to view titles. Scrolling down the list, you can see that sign show the update status of each guideline. There isn't a very good match for my scenario, but I'll follow the the link to non-pharmacological management of depression guideline to show you an example. In the body of the guideline, you can see there are evidence levels associated with each recommendation. These guidelines are produced after systematic assessments of available evidence for each recommendation, and there is effort made to be as transparent as possible about the strength of evidence available. Bear in mind that not all clinical guidelines are formulated in the same way as the SIGN ones. SIGN is just one producer of clinical guidelines, and although they are excellent, they may not cover a topic that you need, or may not be appropriately used in your region. TRIP stands for Turning Research into Practice, and it's designed to allow you to find a variety of sources with a single search. This screenshot shows an example of how the PICO format can be used to search in databases. So I've popped in the terms we've been discussing from that scenario. And again, I'm not concerned about the study design in the TRIP database because of the selective content and structure of TRIP. So more on structure next. This slide shows our search results. The text is a bit faint, but I hope you can recognize the first two results as titles that we saw earlier in the Cochrane. The third is also likely to be of interest to the GP in our scenario. At the right, you can see the results are structured in a breakdown by publication type. This helpful breakdown starts with evidence summaries at the top, like systematic reviews and clinical guidelines, and then moves on to primary research, including controlled trials. So I hope you can see this is a handy place to come to search across international guidelines databases as well as systematic reviews and other publication types. I mention TRIP because you may find it a fast and handy resource to find your way into a new area since you can search across these multiple specialist publication types. Now let's say you want to go deeper into the literature to find primary studies. One key place to look, as you're probably aware, is the PubMed database, produced by the National Library of Medicine in the US. It's a huge database with over 20 million records. So to start with, you might want to narrow your search using the Clinical Queries tool. I've adapted my search to go into one search box by putting parentheses around the separate components and typing the AND combining operators manually. The parentheses help to ensure that the terms are combined appropriately, so the OR groups are pooled internally with OR first, and then combined with AND for the final results. The Clinical Queries tool in PubMed filters out papers reporting studies of particular designs or methods. So for example, the default therapy filter will look for papers on your topic that report using trials or use words like randomized, or that focus on therapeutic use. There are a few other filters too, so please have a look and experiment with the different options in the clinical queries. The last resource I thought I'd highlight as part of this presentation is a register of controlled trials. This is one excellent way of finding out about newly funded and ongoing studies, as well as completed ones.
So if you don't find as many reports of trials as you had expected in a place like PubMed, then this could be a useful next step. One of the great uses of a database like this one is to identify research that has not been published. So this goes back to my earlier point about publication bias. You may use a database like this one to find studies on your topic of interest and follow up on any publications, or follow up directly with the authors in case there appear to be no publications. In this example, you can see another variation of the PICO question format in the search interface. I've left the title field empty to leave that flexible, and in the condition and intervention boxes, I've searched using the same strings as in the earlier database examples. But don't be surprised if you need to simplify your search considerably for this database. We get about 60 trials. This is just the first page. So thinking back to our scenario, I see a few results that are interesting, partly because of the military context, although alcohol abuse was not a factor in our case. Research registers should, in theory, make allocation of research resources more transparent and allow you to assess whether a topic is already being addressed or whether new studies could be justified. I hope that was both thought-provoking and useful and that you're ready to start exploring the resources we've looked at for yourself. If you've watched this presentation as part of an integrated course activity, please post questions or feedback about this presentation on the course discussion board. If you have a question, then it's bound to be the case that others on the course are wondering the same thing. I've also added a link at the bottom to one of our library resource web pages focusing on tools and resources for evidence-based medicine and clinical practice that go beyond the items mentioned in this presentation. So, thanks for watching and goodbye for now.